um, here with Deirdre and Paul and Josh and David Lehman, and um, happy to answer your questions. Let me give you just a quick update on where we are in COVID. It's been a busy um, few days in our country, both with the election and what's going on uh, with the pandemic. <clears throat> Want to put the first uh, daily summary up there? Um, what you'll see here, I think, is the positivity rate is um, in the current hospitalizations have leveled off just a little bit, uh, but it's going to be bouncing around, and the trend has still been up. Uh, the fatalities are uh, 11, um, a disheartening number. I'd like to focus on the tests reported, 31,000 tests. Um, compare that to maybe getting 20 Thank tests you. a day in back at, during the early days uh, in the spring. Uh, we're trying to get the testing is almost more ubiquitous, ubiquitous than it's ever been before. Easier to do, taking the PCR test to you with the mobile labs. And uh, today I was at a McDonough school in a Middletown where we had the Binax test, which I've talked to you about before, where you get a virtually instant response in about 15 minutes. And uh, it's very accurate in terms of people with symptoms, what that means in terms of a school, what that means in terms of Look, if you have um, any type of um, symptoms, don't show up at school, don't go. But if you get those symptoms while you're at school, we give you that test and we can get you a response uh, within 15 minutes. That's allowing us to keep our schools open. But I say that in the sense that um, between the Binax test and the PCR testing and the wastewater and the saliva tests, um, there are lots of different categories. How we're trying to stay ahead of this uh, infection as best we can. That said, we still have some work to do. Look at the next chart. Uh, this is um, our version of the uh, measles map. Uh, you maybe remember from uh, just uh, three weeks ago, there were four towns on it, and then there were uh, 30 towns on it, and now there are 42 towns on this map. And um, it represents about 60% of our population Red meaning you have 15 COVID cases detected uh, per 100,000 on a daily basis. Um, this is a map that suggests that while we have moved to statewide protocols, no more trying to just put out the fire in a, a local uh, municipality. And I'm afraid to say that this is the map when we had our quarantine, it was member around the country. It was limited to just several states and then it ended up being um, virtually for every state in the country. So you see um, this map on an expanded basis nationwide. Um, if you're straining your eyes, you can go to ct.gov, COVID. You can look up your town, ct.gov, schools. You can see exactly what's going on in your schools. So um, you have in all, no uncertain terms, exactly uh, what's going on. I, it, it also reminds us that back in the spring, COVID was more limited. Remember, it was just the southern part of the state, and back then we could have a mutual aid in the northern part of the state. Hartford and Trinity could provide some uh, nursing and some vents and the help. And we were able to help New York when they were most on fire, so we were able to uh, triage and move our people around and actually able to do that in different parts of the country as well. Well, today you don't have that opportunity. So that is an extra reason why we are monitoring hospital capacity very well, because we don't have a lot of easy overflow to the northern part of the state or the southern part of the state. So that's the reason that we are um, moving towards these statewide protocols. We sort of previewed them um, uh, a few days ago, and this is going to be the executive order that goes into effect at uh, midnight tonight. A couple of um, Reminders in here and a couple of small changes. Restaurants, we've taken from 75% to 50% capacity. A little more spacing. Six people to the table. I think before we had maybe tried a little more than that. And that's because you had some big parties at these tables that um, involved eating, but involved a lot more than that. And we thought this was uh, safer to do. Uh, we listened to the restaurants and we've also worked with uh, our fellow um, governors, especially uh, Charlie Baker up in Massachusetts. So we've said, look, the last service, last call at the restaurant is going to be 9.30 p.m. and the dining room will close at 10. Give people a little bit more uh, breathing room there. Uh, but they can continue to do takeout, as you remember, just like we have in the past. Personal services, 75%, uh, no change there. 
gathering sizes, um, I want you to focus on the private gatherings. Uh, this is something we're doing in association with all of our governors in the region. Um, and that's because, as you remember Deirdre saying this some uh, weeks ago, it's those informal private gatherings where we're seeing um, the ignition taking off in terms of the infection rate. So no more than 10, indoor or outdoor. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, I gotta count on your um, self-monitoring this as, uh, as well as you can. You know, Thanksgiving dinner, 10. Uh, that dinner party, 10. Um, and we're really recommending the people, um, you know, be home by 10 o'clock at night. You see that at the bottom there. Same protocols, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, I might add as well. Uh, it's just this, a little easier to stay safe, stay at home. Uh, performing arts capacity at 100, religious gatherings, um, no change there. Anything you can do virtually for business, anything you can do virtually with those religious gatherings is really recommended. Religious gatherings sometimes attract a slightly older demographic. Uh, better to stay safe, stay at home. Let me talk now about um, the sports sector, which we've alluded to in the past. It took a little more time for us to um, clarify, because I really wanted to do this uh, with uh, Rhode Island and uh, Massachusetts. Um, no hosting in Connecticut of any of these uh, regional competitions or tournaments. Uh, you've heard us say before, we were having a lot of folks coming in from out of state for hockey tournaments and the such, and um, uh, we gotta stay closer to home. Uh, so uh, we're not gonna allow that. Massachusetts is not gonna allow that. Um, Rhode Island is not gonna allow that. New York has really uh, you know, cut way back on any competition regarding high school sports, period. So that means that no Connecticut team will travel out of state for games. Um, uh, that's gonna start on Monday. My recommendation is for these things, uh, don't do it this weekend. Uh, no high-risk sports, I'll get to exactly what they are in a minute, um, will be played for the rest of 2020. Uh, don't worry, you'll see that the medium risk sports, hockey, basketball, the ones uh, you're most used to, are, are still allowed. But for those indoor sports like hockey and basketball, uh, wear a mask. Uh, that's true of our neighboring states as well, all trying to enforce this. New Hampshire has been doing this for hockey for you know, now a few weeks anyway, finally we're able to do this, do this safely. We are sitting on the side of the rink, you know, uh, 12 of you lined up wearing the mask. It's so important. And we're gonna be asking uh, the leagues and the such to uh, come up with the uh, protocols necessary regarding spectators. You know, we're saying uh, two family members per uh, competitor. Uh, rosters, that's really important. If uh, DPH asks, um, if your local public health department asks, um, tell us who's on the roster for that hockey team, that hockey game. If there's an infection, we need to know that. Give us their contact information so we can do a prompt track and trace and really try and limit the spread as best we can. Um, this next chart just gives you a little more indication of what are the high risk sports that we don't want to have played between now and the end of the year, will not be played between now and the end of the year, and what are those medium risk sports. And before we start, you know, fussing and how come this is here and that's there, um, we decided to just rely upon the National Federation of High School Sports. So this is uh, not uniform, every state's doing their thing, but we've just taken the protocols as set by the National Association and run with that. So I'm afraid that means that uh, wrestling and, as you know, 11 on 11 football, um, not to be played, boxing, um, competitive cheer uh, between now and the end of the year. Um, and in the yellow are those sports that are medium risk, which uh, you can do, play more uh, cautiously, uh, but no out-of-state tournaments, no out of, um, going out-of-state to play, and that includes uh, um, you know, basketball and hockey, indoor sports, which will be played uh, with a mask. So we're doing <clears throat> everything we can to allow our sports and schools to go um, as best as we can, doing everything we can to keep you safe because um, we're not out of the woods yet. And we got some work to do, and that's true of our state, which is still um, eighth lowest infection rate in the country, but I take no solace in that at all. And there is risk, and I've seen what's going on in some of those other states which have an infection rate of 30, 40 percent. So it, let's err on the side of caution a little bit longer. Uh, with that, we have um, a stand-in, Rob Blanchard, who can handle the calls. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll start with the Hartford Current.
Okay, we'll move on to Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hey, good afternoon, Governor. Um, so, first question is, with uh, the restriction on 10 people, how do you how do you expect people to, to go along with that? I mean, just over the last weekend, we saw some, I know some uh, gatherings at restaurants and such. Um, how, do you, how do you expect to enforce that? And, and do you think people will actually go along with it? I think Connecticut has been pretty good on that so far. First of all, um, you're right, in the restaurants, some of the bigger crowds there, that's why 9.30, 10 o'clock close was much easier to enforce. Uh, and when it comes to a private gathering at your home, um, we're just telling you, use your judgment. Uh, if, if you can limit it to 10 and your neighbors limit it to 10 and we can put up with this just like they are in our neighboring states, we're all going to be better off for it. All right, Connecticut Mirror. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Rob. Can uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, Governor, talk a little, if you could, about uh, Thanksgiving. It, it, that, that's going to be limited to 10 people as well? That's going to be limited to 10 people. Um, we've talked about this before. I've talked about this with our governors in neighboring states. Uh, look, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. I get it. Um, we've talked about that before. But um, uh, do it now. Do it this Thanksgiving. Put up with this a little bit longer. Or we're going to be much better off for the long term. Right. Um, and the the six people at a table, that's down from what you said earlier, right? Were you saying eight eight people at a table in a restaurant when uh, we talked initially about the phase two go back? Is that a change, Gov David? Yeah, Governor, if I may, that was a, a typo that I should have caught earlier. We, we are at eight people per table, uh, and that is that is where we were on Monday, and we continue to be at eight people per table. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, as far as schools go, Governor, is there any metric of uh, infection rates in, in a town or statewide where you would recommend schools um, sort of revert back to the strictly remote learning? Well, I think you saw in Danbury they got up to 7 or 8 percent infection rate. They uh, decided not to open at that point. Um, Norwich got a little higher and they uh, went to remote learning. Um, by the same token, um, as I've said this uh, before, I look at places like France, Germany, and Britain, which have um, much higher infection rates, and they have kept their schools open. Uh, they really made that an absolute priority. And it's worth noting, even as our infection rate has crept up from 1 percent to 3.5 or 4, um, our, our infection rates in the schools has, has been um, much less than that. Uh, especially for the younger grades, it's still, uh, relatively speaking, the uh, safest place to be. But um, I'm, I'm hoping we can keep that going a while longer. So there's no uh, certain number per 100,000 uh, infections where, where the state would say, okay, it's time to, let's go ahead and move back to remote? No, not at this point. We still left that up to the judgment of the um, school districts themselves. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, thank you. We'll come back to the Hartford Current. Hey, everybody. This is Emily Brinley from The Current. Uh, sorry about that earlier. Um, Governor, could you explain a bit about limiting the private gatherings to a maximum of 10 people? That's a, a pretty significant change. change. Can you um, explain a little bit about the logic behind that? Yeah, I'll start, and then maybe you guys can help me out. But um, as you heard from Dr. Burks, as you heard from Deirdre, as we've heard from all the experts, it's these small, informal, private gatherings, often at our homes. We're most likely to let our guard down. It's a friend or a friend of the friends. We feel like, okay, that's fine. <clears throat> and it's our strong feeling that if we can limit those private gatherings uh, for a period of time, it will, it will make an, a real difference. Obviously, it makes a big difference in terms of track and trace as well and getting ahead of this. But um, Joshua Deirdre, do you want to add to that? 
Um, I, I would just reiterate what you said, uh, Governor, which is exactly the case. Um, th this has been nationally a source of uh, spread of COVID. And as we see our level of community transmission continue to increase in Connecticut, that just means the odds that someone you have over to your home, unfortunately, is even more, that much more likely to have an asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic case of COVID. Uh, we tend to let down our guard a little bit in terms of masks and distancing when we're inside our own homes. So for all of those reasons, it, it makes a lot of sense and we think it will really significantly um, help our transmission if we limit the, the gatherings. It's a, it's a painful thing to be discussing at the holidays, um, but it, it's a, a really important step for all of us uh, to consider taking given where we are now with the community transmission in Connecticut. Thank you. And if we're talking about a cap of 10 people at gatherings, um, can you explain why that isn't a concern with classrooms, which obviously usually have many more than 10 children in them? Well, I'll start with that. Um, first of all, the infection rate we're finding um, in schools, especially at the lower grades, much less likely to be shedding the virus. We found around the country, around the world, as well as Connecticut, that wearing a mask in the classroom is... Um, you know, one of the safest places uh, to be right now. Uh, we found that most of our school-related infections actually happen outside of the classroom, maybe the hybrid or the uh, remote learners. But any of you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say that um, many of the measures that the governor and, and Commissioner Lehman have been talking about are um, are designed to support us to be able uh, to continue to have in-person learning because it's so critical for our children. And um, so some of these things are really, uh, the, the goals of, of these activities really are um, not only to prevent infections, preserve our uh, hospital and healthcare capacity, as the governor said, um, but to uh, contain the community spread as much as possible so we can preserve the ability for kids uh, to continue to go to school because it's important for them and their well-being to be able to do so. And one last clarification question on the, the sports rules that you just announced, Governor. Um, it says, you said no, 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 that's not right. You said medium risk sports must wear a mask. Is that during gameplay that they must wear a mask? That's right. Um, we're doing that in an association. Rhode Island's doing this. Uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire has been doing this. We're finding that the kids are able to make that work okay. Look, this does not include uh, college and um, professional sports. We're really focused on K through 12, doing everything you can to allow them to continue to play a sport safely. So you're saying not just mass on the sidelines, but while players are playing as well. That's right. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Waterbury, Republican-American. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, this year, Thanksgiving is on November 26th. Uh, on December 25th, there's another big uh, holiday uh, gathering that uh, tends to bring families together. What are the possibility of this 10-person limit being in place at Christmas time? Well, I'll start, and maybe I can hand it over to Josh. I mean, I, I think you heard um, from a lot of the science folks that have come, including Dr. Uh, Murphy from New Vance, that uh, a lot of our models show that this infection rate may continue to climb uh, through the end of this year. We're doing everything we can to contain that, but they said the same thing in France and Germany and uh, uh, some parts of the mid Midwest, and it did continue to climb. So, um, uh, look, I'm always looking for a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's a little further off. Uh, Dr. Gifford? Want that, Deirdre? Yes, I, 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 I echo the governor's comments on that. I think it's, uh, it, 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 we have a ways to go here. Um, and we we're, we're, um, need to take these steps now to turn this um, uh, ex, uh, increase around, but it's likely that we'll continue to see this, um, these cases in, into December. Uh, what is the current seven-day rolling average of uh, positive test rates that the state is uh, using? It's 3.5, Paul. 
3.5. And how does that compare to, say, June? Is that another high from uh, June or something like that? It's actually down a tick from the last couple of days. Um, but, yeah, it compares roughly to where we were in early June. Okay. Um, I know we asked the uh, earlier governor at the, at the Middletown event, but is um, there any timetable regarding the distribution or, or at least the expansion of this pilot program? I mean, uh, to see how these uh, tests uh, work out and uh, identify any snags that need to be worked out? Yeah, um, what Paul's referring to and I alluded to was uh, um, Middletown is our first K through 12. We're rolling out um, the antigen testing, the, um, the Binax, as well as bringing in uh, the PCR testing so that we'll be able to get ahead of um, infections in, in the uh, K through 12 level. And uh, based upon what we see going on in Middletown, I think you heard uh, Miguel Cordona, the Commissioner of Education, say we want to roll this out um, statewide. Um, we'll, we'll have to see what the protocols are, and we're limited a little bit by um, the nature of the Binax test we do get from the federal government, but um, they have promised us uh, a million tests um, by the end of this year. Right now, we're at about 150,000 tests, and so far, so good. Okay, and, um, you know, I know you've sort of alluded to this in your discussion of this 10-person limit, but what can you tell Connecticut as we verge on this uh, rollback uh, in our reopening rules about how long that, that this may last? I think we sort of alluded to that before, but a lot of the models suggest that um, this could go, uh, you know, through the end of this year. But as um, Josh has pointed out many times, models are models, and they can change all the time. And through our behavior, we have some ability to uh, flatten that curve, which will allow us to get back to a new normal a little sooner. And just one last question. Um, have you, uh, is your administration at all talking to New York State about a 930 uh, uh, cut off on, on table service. Uh, I was just looking at the rules earlier uh, today, and it looks like uh, they're sort of doing their um, uh, restaurant regulation on a, uh, on a COVID-19 rate base, uh, sort of a cluster system. Well, you're, you're exactly right about that, Paul. We've had some conversations, and Paul Mounds has talked to their chief of staff quite a bit, and um, I'll let him, but basically they're still not doing anything on a state wide basis for reason you know they're a big state um and uh so they've got their pockets for example in parts of brooklyn and queens uh there they've got 25 percent capacity in their restaurants where we're say at 50 percent capacity but they have other parts of the state that are up at 50 percent they have not capped uh, at 9 30 at this point in the uh, city that never sleeps uh, but i think it's something they may be looking at as well as time goes on yeah, just to echo the governor's uh, comments, uh, as we do with all of our guidance and any of the changes that we make, uh, we share that information with our regional partners. Uh, as you all know, New York, New Jersey, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, going all the way down to Delaware just for best practices uh, showing. But as uh, the governor stated, yes, they are going based upon their regional uh, basis, uh, based upon their uh, system that they have put up. Um, county by county uh, but we will continue to having conversations with new york uh, as we will with all of our regional partners but uh, we're, we're happy to uh, have some alignment with our, our partners uh, to the to the north and to the east right now well really because I, I thought matt uh, excuse me i know i said the last question but at R rhode island i believe uh, allows um, service after 11 o'clock no no alcohol and bar areas have to be closed but i i don't believe uh, rhode island has announced a 9 30 uh cut off yet, have they? I think they may be a little bit later, but we're 100 percent aligned with Massachusetts. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. The Day of New London. All right. Connecticut Public Media. Associated Press. Thanks, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, I have a couple questions about the sports changes. 
Uh, does this eliminate the 11 on 11 independent high school football league that's been set up? I believe it does as of uh, Monday when it goes into effect. Okay. And um, also, what does this mean for that uh, bubble that they have planned at Mohegan Sun for college based basketball? I understand that a UConn player just tested positive. Yeah, I think I'll pass that one over to Paul. Um, he's been in contact with UConn. But you're right about the bubble. I mean, college sports, they're much able to um, keep within their cohort in a way that's more complicated for high school and elementary school sports. So that's why we've allowed um, uh, the, the sports to continue at places like UConn. Paul, anything about that infection? Yeah, well, we were uh, alerted by uh, UConn Athletics uh, before they put out their announcement that a player on the UConn Huskies basketball men's basketball team has tested uh, positive for COVID-19. They are taking all the necessary protocols, um, including uh, shutting down their practice facility for uh, cleaning. As you know, the, the UConn uh, Athletics has a very aggressive uh, testing protocol for their student athletes, and the Department of Public Health will uh, continue their conversations as they have been uh, throughout this whole crisis uh, with UConn Athletics. And we've provided a more formal update uh, in the coming day. So, Paul, the, the bubble is going to move forward? No plans yes. to change? Yeah, as the, as the governor stated earlier, uh, the protocols that we put forth are for K through 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I know in our conversations with Mohegan Sun, UConn Athletics, uh, they're very aggressive in terms of uh, their protocols, particularly on the testing uh, that will be done uh, in that bubble. And we will be continuously uh, working with Mohegan Sun, who's been a, a great partner uh, with Department of Public Health and with uh, DECD and David Lehman in providing us uh, thorough updates in any of their uh, developments uh, going forward. Thanks for that. And yesterday, uh, Governor, I understand Governor Cuomo, uh, he issued some new rules for travelers. And I know that Connecticut is exempt, but I just wanted to see if Connecticut is planning some of the same things. Like, for instance, um, travelers have to get tested within three days prior to landing in New York, and they have to quarantine at least three days upon arrival. You have to get a new test on day four. If both are negative, then you can leave quarantine. And then there was something, too, about if a traveler is out of state for less than 24 hours, you don't need to quarantine, but then you have to check in and have um, take a test on day four. Is Connecticut planning any of that type of stuff? Well, I'll start. I mean, man, that's complicated, isn't it? I know, uh, I know. I think the bottom really line is, look, um, you're much better off if you quarantined for all the different testing protocols, and that's how we started. We had a lot of people that... Um, you couldn't necessarily do that 14-day uh, quarantine. So we said, look, if you test before you come for a few days and test when you get here, uh, do that. But maybe Deirdre can talk a little bit about our uh, quarantine, especially as, uh, as it regards um, we're going to have thousands of students coming back from college, some from very infected regions. What, what do we recommend there? Yeah. So as the governor mentioned uh, on Monday when he announced some of these changes in the sector rules, it really is um, – now a good idea to limit all non-essential travel um, as much as possible. So that's the first thing to say is that we're, we're continuing to recommend that if you don't have to travel, um, stay close to home. And um, our travel advisory does continue to say that if you're coming to Connecticut, if you've been um, out of the state for more than 24 hours or if you're coming here from another state that's on our list, you should take a test before you leave your home state um, if you don't do that, um, you need to quarantine uh, when you arrive in Connecticut or take a test uh, on arrival, and you should remain quarantined until you take a test. So it's limit travel and get a test uh, before, you, uh, before you leave your home state and um, uh, quarantine as much as possible until you get a negative test in Connecticut. Okay, thanks. thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Sue. News 8. So is there any evidence, you know, the track and trace, we say that schools are a safe place for children. What does it look like for sporting events? Are you seeing the, the transmission of the disease on sporting teams during track and trace? Well, I'll start, but uh, as you know, we've seen a lot of infections in and around sports, in and around hockey. That's why Massachusetts uh, paused or closed down their hockey rinks, um, their skating rinks for a couple of weeks. 
until we could uh, get in place some rules that made it safer to be able to play these games in terms of what goes on, um, you know, not in the locker room, wearing the masks and the such. Uh, anybody else want to take a crack at that question? That's it. <laughs> no, all right, so you haven't seen any, like the track and trace, there hasn't been, I guess that's done at the local level. Well, so what we did want to do about was, um, look, we were having a hard time with some of these teams, and they had an infection. We said, who else was, um, you know, in close contact with that infected player, and not everybody was responding. So one of the rules you saw in place is, look, your team is going to be playing. We'd like to know who's on the roster and how we can contact them if there is an infection. Uh, that way, your team can continue to play safely, and it's much less likely when the team goes back to high school or whatever it is, we've got the virus more contained. Yeah, um, so we have seen, um, Governor, to add to that, a, a really big impact on our local health departments on the contact tracing related to sports. So we've seen, obviously, because we're seeing more um, COVID in the community, we're seeing more players on these various teams that have a COVID infection. Um, and uh, as the governor alluded to, have been able to trace back some outbreaks related to at least hockey. But the real struggle for our local health departments, who are quite busy right now with their uh, all of the uh, enforcement and um, uh, contact tracing that they're doing, is that when they have a particularly a, a, a school kid um, that's on a team and, and if they've been at a tournament exposed to COVID, um, then the contact tracing uh, is, is very uh, challenging and time consuming. And, they're telling us it's beginning to impact the ability of some schools to remain open because so many kids are being asked to quarantine. And sometimes it's teachers as well if they're acting as coaches. So it's sort of a compounding effect of infections related to the sports, but also um, just the follow on effects of having an infected child that played in a game or a tournament. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Channel three, Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, a question for um, Dr. Gifford. You know, we're seeing towns with an infection rate on that red alert list that just spikes to the point where they're really just skipping the orange alert and just going straight to red. Is that unusual or is that to be expected in this second wave? Um, well, to a certain extent, um, you know, this is the nature of this virus. Um, as you've heard me say before, it's a highly contagious uh, virus. And so when you get to um, a certain level of, of virus in the community and you're having lots of contacts, um, that's when you start to see that kind of exponential increase in cases. And we're fortunate in Connecticut that we've got a lot of testing going on, so we're actually able to watch that now in a way that we didn't see it back in the spring. But um, I think the point that the governor and, and Josh and myself are, have all been trying to make is that when you get to a level of community prevalence of this virus, your odds of bumping into somebody in any kind of activity, whether it's low risk, medium risk, or high risk, um, your odds of bumping into somebody with COVID goes up quite a bit. So that's why the governor's actions are meant to reduce those types of activities and particularly those that are high risk because we need to start breaking that cycle of transmission. Got it. Uh, question for the governor. Phase uh, 2.1, it's not going to really affect the tribal casinos and we haven't heard of any changes on our end uh, that's going to be happening. What conversations have you had with them and what were the results of that? We're having very positive conversations. Uh, as they know, um, our 2.1 is uh, limiting restaurants and certainly uh, alcohol after a certain hour, um, 9.30. Uh, we'd like to see them follow similar protocols. I can tell you that uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island were having very similar discussions as well. We'd like to do that um, as close as we can as one. I don't want um, a lot of people from Rhode Island saying, hey, let's drive to uh, Connecticut or vice versa. Uh, so I think we'll have some um, uh, good announcements to make on that very soon. Perfect. And final question now for um, Mr. Lehman. Are there any details on any financial support for the impacted businesses um, as we enter phase 2.1? 
Thank you for the question. So the, the main program that we have out there is the Small Business Assistant, Assistance Grant Program, which is $50 million, where we think we can help up to 10,000 uh, small businesses across the state of Connecticut that have suffered a 20% or more revenue drop this year. Uh, beyond that, we're certainly happy to consider other programs. And uh, as we go through this winter and fall here, you know, we want to better get a sense of what this impact is. Uh, and of course, as the governor's mentioned, all eyes are on Washington, D.C. as well for stimulus here as we get past the presidential race. All right, thank you. NBC Connecticut. Hi, Governor Matt Austin with NBC Connecticut. It looks like we got about a quarter of towns that now fall underneath that red alert. I'm just wondering, with that many, is there a certain point that we're going to hit when this, when this list just becomes unworkable and that we just need to either change the metrics or just change the system itself? Yeah, man, I, I think we are changing the system. Look, it's still worthwhile for you to see um, where your town is, where your region is in terms of the heat map and infection. But you're absolutely right. I mean, right now it encompasses 60 percent of our population. So that's why we're doing everything on a statewide basis and even more importantly on a regional basis, sort of similar to where we were uh, six months ago. And then also had a question. New Haven had a warning for a Walmart there that um, might be potentially shut down because of repeated COVID-related violations. Were you made aware of that case? And overall, do you think enforcement needs to get tougher with businesses that are not complying? Uh, I don't know about that particular case. Uh, maybe one of you guys do. But look, I think we've got to be tough on this enforcement. It's no fair for those uh, overwhelming majority of stores that are open. They're staying open. We haven't limited their ability to keep open, unlike in Europe where they all had to shut down. So if you want to be able to keep your store open, especially if you're a Walmart, a big brand name like that, lead by example. And yeah, there will be consequences if uh, there are violations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fox 61. Hi everyone. Um, so Governor Lamar, if I'm understanding correctly, it's probably the most important to limit the private gatherings to stop the spread, but that's also harder to enforce. So are there any specific enforcement measures you're considering, or is this more of an honor system? Look, we're obviously uh, strict on enforcement in those commercial establishments and um, those event venues and those bars slash restaurants. What goes on in your home is uh, going to be more on the honor system. But um, Connecticut's pretty good at the honor system. And then I actually have an election question for you. If Vice President Biden wins and asks you to serve federally in any capacity, will you leave the governor's office in Connecticut to do that? No, I'll tell him I got the best job in the world right here in Connecticut. And we still have a lot of work to do. How can I help you from Connecticut? Thanks. News 12, Connecticut. Good afternoon. A lot of restaurants we spoke with today say they haven't received any guidance yet. They just heard on Monday at the press conference that they had to close early. Is that guidance going to be up on the state's website by 12 a.m. tonight? Thank you for the question. It's David Lehman. That guidance is actually up on the DECD website right now. Uh, we just put it out at 4 o'clock. Thank you. And a lot of the restaurants we spoke with today, again, are saying that they've heard over and over the governor say um, the CDC and contact tracing shows the spread is not through restaurants. And, of course, they're very frustrated by this executive order. Um, just wondering your response to that, Governor. Uh, well, look, I'll let Deirdre, because she can give you some of the numbers that we've seen on restaurants. But look, when you have community spread, it's a more broadly in the community than it was, say, a month ago. And if you have 100 people in a restaurant, you've got a 4 percent positivity rate, four of them in there. So you're right. Spacing is really important. Those protocols are more important than ever. 930 is important. And um, look, I'm doing everything I can to keep the restaurants open. We can only do it if people feel safe there. But Deirdre, what are your numbers, Joe? Yeah, so um, of course, as we as as this pandemic uh, progresses, we learn more and more about you know where spread is is likely to happen, and that knowledge base is is changing all the time. So I, I certainly understand um, you know questions about you know why this setting, et cetera. 
A couple things unique to restaurants, and it's just, you know, by the nature of their business, we're not wearing masks. Um, we often have people from unrelated households at the same table. And so those are the types of conditions where um, you, you are more likely to see spread. They're, they're indoors, in, and at least uh, when it, we're talking about indoor dining. Um, there was, as, as uh, David Lehman mentioned, there was a CDC study that came out, or I think it was around six weeks ago. Um, you know, it was a preliminary study, but it did suggest um, a much higher odds of uh, having been in a restaurant for people that had COVID compared to people that didn't have COVID. And finally, I would say that um, over the last couple of months at the Department of Public Health, we've been doing some work with our local health department partners to look at outbreaks. Um, you know, we can trace, we have a lot of cases now, but in some cases we can trace groups of infections back to a certain location or, or type of a venue. And uh, restaurants is uh, one of the more common places where we've seen outbreaks uh, related. So, you know, put all those things together, the nature of the, the uh, venue, the CDC study, our contact tracing, and, uh, you know, the international experience, it, it does indicate that restaurants um, do pose some increased risk. All right. All right. WTIC 1080 News. Hi, David. How tough could this holiday season get for retailers? We've spoken a lot about the restaurants, but what about the stores? Do you have numbers on, on how much they'll be off? So thank you for the question. Um, retail, it's obviously a significant industry, and we, we are very mindful how important November and December in particular are for retail. Um, you know, the one thing we have seen, though, since uh, May when we reopened retail is the retail experience, uh, it is quite possible to distance. Masks are worn the whole time, um, and it's a typically a short duration experience. You're in the store for 15 minutes, maybe 30, 45 minutes, depending on what you're shopping for. So from a, from a health risk perspective, we're actually quite comfortable with retail uh, and going into Main Street shops or other big box stores. We think that's something that folks can do safely uh, because of the three reasons I just mentioned. So we're, we're hopeful that customers and consumers will have confidence to do that, but to also embrace the safeguards while shopping for the holidays. And Mr. Governor, Joe Biden, according to the AP, is six electoral votes out from becoming president-elect. Are you hearing security concerns from state police and so on? I know there's, there's a lot of tension over this, let's put it that way. Uh, there's a lot of hot rhetoric on uh, social media, and uh, our uh, state police are monitoring that very carefully. Um, but right now, there's nothing, um, nothing happening here in the state of Connecticut. We're going to keep it that way. If that, if that does happen tonight, you want to pre preview your reaction to uh, what, what apparently is going to happen? Well, look, I've uh, seen around the country, as you have, that stores are boarding up. They've been um, hit before. They don't want to break another window. There's fears of vandalism, maybe folks upset with the um, outcome one way or the other. But, um, look, I think at the end of the day, uh, the people of Connecticut um, are going to handle this responsibly. and. Um, coalesce around the next uh, president of the United States. Yeah, I was going for your reaction on Biden becoming president, potentially. <laughs> uh, look, I think, um, A, we need clarity. B, I don't do a lot of politics here, but most people know I supported Joe Biden pretty early on, and uh, I think he's going to make a big difference for our state. When it comes to state and local aid that allows all of our states to power through that recession, it's going to be really important for us. Thank you. All right, that's the uh, signal from Rob Blanchard. Um, as you can see on here, I just wanted to say um, this is the election that never ends. I mean, we all started voting a month before Election Day, or many people did, and it's now um, a couple days later, and we're seeking resolution soon, as we just alluded to. But I was really proud of the fact that um, we had the largest turnout, I think, in the history of the state. <clears throat> I'm proud of the fact that Connecticut um, voted. Many voted absentee, which I think was appropriate, especially given the nature of COVID and um, how it hits the older population. It's proud of the fact that people lined up there, you see, with their uh, masks going forward. And I'm proud of the fact that despite all the noise in and around politics, people know that their vote makes a difference. And uh, I guess there's an older guy with his younger wife in the other frame. Anyway, have a great fun uh, this weekend with your nine best friends. <laughs>